There are at least two news that I consider extremely important for uh, the field of AI and large language models that have been quite unnoticed. And uh, that's exactly what I would like to cover today and uh, yeah, share some opinions. So let's have a look at uh, the very first news that I got really uh, amazed by, which is the, the one uh, reported by the register um, uh, very recently. So this is the news from the uh, 20th of October. And uh, uh, the CEO of Baidu, essentially, um, so Baidu, for those who don't know, is the equivalent of Google in China, right? Now, the CEO of such a massive corporation, certain Robin Lee, he said, uh, AI bubble will burst 99% of players. And uh, he also said other things, but, you know, already in this news, there is like something extremely scary that everybody's ignoring. And without taking too much credit, we have been talking about this stuff at least uh, since one year and a half. Um, it's quite obvious that there is a hype. <clears throat> and of course, um, you know, when a certain Robin Lee, CEO of Baidu, is repeating uh, what, uh, you know, many technical people are, are claiming since years, well, it's something that people should pay attention to. That's at least my personal opinion. Now, what he proclaimed is that hallucinations produced by large language models are no longer a problem. And that's very, very true. Uh, there's been a lot of improvement since we, uh, you know, got in touch with large language models the very first time uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and then it says, and then it predicted a massive wipeout, wipeout of AI startups when the bubble bursts. So this means that, first of all, it's a when, not a if anymore. Um, we all know there is a bubble and uh, we just don't know when it's going to burst. And when it does, uh, it's going to take out all um, a majority of the AI startups that we know. And this is also another thing that we have been telling a number of times on this show, um, which is due to the fact that many startups out there are heavily relying on um, you know, the technology of OpenAI. Many of those are actually relying on OpenAI's API. So this means that their core business is essentially served by OpenAI, meaning that whatever happens to OpenAI will happen to their company, right? So they don't have this kind of independence. Very few have this kind of independence or a backup, for example, when you are, you know, if you want to switch from OpenAI to another provider for large, large language models. But of course, that's something that, you know, usually you cannot do it overnight. So when that happens, you are screwed. Then you said also many other things. For example, the most significant change we're, uh, we're seeing over the past 18 to 20 months, so exactly one year and a half, um, is the accuracy of those answers from the large language models. Um, and then he concludes that you can basically trust the answer now, which is <clears throat> only partially true. You can trust it definitely more than you could uh, a year and a half ago. But, you know, there are still, um, you know, mm, edge cases for which you better not trust blindly what the large language model is telling you but in any case this is very true i totally agree with this uh you know with the statement of um, uh, robin lee who's a very experienced guy i mean i'm uh, i'm uh, absolutely in agreement with him uh, probably one percent of the companies will stand out and become huge and will create a lot of value all the rest will basically fail that's what he claims and uh, also this is something that i definitely agree with now, there is another news that I want to comment, um, which is, in fact, um, one before this, uh, actually at the beginning of the month, uh, proposed by The Atlantic. Uh, it's time to stop taking Sam Altman <laughs> at his word uh, by David Karp, who made an amazing job at uh, you know, explaining a bit the state of uh, things at OpenAI. Uh, understand AI for what it is, not what it might become. Okay, fine. Basically, uh, David is telling us, you know, not to take Sam Altman seriously. Um, there have been a lot of journalists and, uh, I don't know, influencers or whatever you want to call, uh, you know, pretty, let's say, yeah, believing blindly in the words of, uh, of Sam Altman, who might be a visionary, but, uh, um, you know, there are many things that don't really match, at least that's to the, you know, based on the opinion of many, not just mine. So the very first part of the news, which uh, was published on October the 4th, um, is about the new funding of OpenAI. So OpenAI, as you might know already, got a, f a fund, uh, got funded of another $6.6 .6 billion uh, beginning of the month. 
Uh, and so now they have an evaluation at uh, $157 billion as we speak. Um, now, this is impressive, uh, definitely. It's also impressive that this is a company that actually burns something like $7 billion a year. So, you know, no, no degrees in mathematics needed here. Uh, you understand that this last investment will not last one year, right? It will last less than a year. Um, and <laughs> I've heard people even saying, since the valuation of the company is almost $160 billion, it means that, you know, these guys can be in the field or around for another couple of decades, you know, which is absolutely nonsense because this is virtual money. This is money they don't have, right? This is the money that investors believe the company they are investing in, uh, you know, the value of the company they're investing in, but it's not there. So you cannot purchase things with that money. You can purchase things with this money. And guess what? You uh, will purchase things to maintain the regular operations uh, in um, 11 months, uh, probably 10. And that's gonna, you know, these 6.6 .6 billion are going to be, uh, you know, burned. Now, this is not really the core of the news because the actual core of the news is about what Sam Altman on the other side is doing, which is convincing or try to convince the investors that, first of all, they did a great job. Uh, it was a great decision to put money at stake and uh, they should call other investors because, you know, they need money. They need more money. And so he wrote this uh, intelligence age. Um, uh, it's called an online manifesto, which is kind of a big word. And I definitely would like to go through that in this. Um, in, in, I want to take 10 minutes of, of your time to go through that because it is absolutely gold <laughs> in a bad way. <laughs> um, now, uh, before we get to the intelligence uh, age, um, uh, you, have to know, you have to know that um, what Sam Altman's, you know, the too long didn't read version of that, uh, of that manifesto is about, is written here essentially. It's like, we will soon be able to work with AI that helps us accomplish much more than we ever could without. So, you know, it's, it's like leveraging AI for doing things that we could not build, apparently. Um, and then, of course, it predicts that uh, we may have an uh, all-powerful super intelligence in a few thousand days, <laughs> whatever that means. Can be a thousand, three thousand, ten thousand. We don't know what does it mean by few thousand days. Um, and uh, all we have to do is, of course, feed this technology enough energy, enough data, and enough chips. <laughs> Basically, uh, giving him more money than he already had. Um, so, you know, of course, there is a, a, a you know, this this manifesto needs to be read, of course, uh, and that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Now, to read this manifesto, you have to allow me to enter in the zone. So let me do it. Okay. In the next couple of decades, we will be able to do things that would have seemed like magic to our grandparents. This phenomenon is not new, but it will be newly accelerated. People have become dramatically more capable over time. We can already accomplish things now that our predecessors would have believed to be impossible. We are more capable not because of genetic change, also because you cannot experience that in like 10 years. You experience genetic change in millions of years, but okay. But because we benefit from the infrastructure of society, being way smarter and more capable than any one of us. It's called the wisdom of the crowd something that people were thinking already in the 90s. In an important sense, society itself is a form of advanced intelligence. That's exactly the wisdom of the crowd, uh, which says that, um, you know, society as a crowd is definitely smarter than each single individual that composes society. Nothing new there, Sam. Our grandparents, again, the grandparents thing, um, and the generations that came before them, built and achieved great things. Okay. They contributed to the scaffolding of human progress that we all benefit from. Yeah, it's called evolution. AI will give people tools to solve hard problems and help us add new struts to that scaffolding that we couldn't have figured out on our own. 
So all of a sudden we became stupid <laughs> without AI, we cannot do stuff. All right. The story of progress will continue and our children will be able to do things we can't. Again, simply evolution, nothing more than that. <clears throat> but wait, it won't happen all at once, but we'll soon be able to work with AI that helps us accomplish much more than we ever could without AI. Eventually, we can each have a personal AI team full of virtual experts in different areas working together to create almost anything we can imagine. Our children will have virtual tutors who can provide personalized instruction in, uh, in any subject, any, in any language. It's called translators. We already have that. And at whatever pace they need, massive online courses do that since already 15 years. We can imagine similar ideas for better healthcare, the ability to create any kind of software, you know, not just one type or two kinds, no, any kind, someone can imagine, and much more. With these new abilities, we can have shared prosperity. This is like the most Zen part of the, of the manifesto. <laughs> um, we can have shared prosperity to a degree that seems unimaginable today. In the future, everyone's life can be better than anyone's life is now. Prosperity alone doesn't necessarily make people happy. Oh no, there are plenty of miserable rich people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always the case, but it would meaningfully improve the lives of people around the world. All right, here's one narrow way to look at human history. After thousands of years of compounding scientific discovery and technological progress, we have figured out how to melt sand, <laughs> add some impurities, arrange it with astonishing precision at extraordinarily tiny scale into computer chips, run energy through it, and end up with systems capable of creating increasingly capable artificial intelligence. This is the most stupid summary I've ever read. Like, really something for, you know, for really kids, and not even smart ones. Like that's the way he explains scientific progress. But this is the best. Now, how did we get to the doorstep of the next leap in prosperity? In three words, so here he probably used ChatGPT to say, answer to this question in three words. Act as Sam Altman and answer this question, but in maximum three words. It says, deep learning worked. <laughs> that's it. And then he tried again and said, okay, now do it in 15 words. Okay, deep learning worked, comma, got predictably better with scale, comma, and we dedicated increasing resources to it, point, period. <laughs> That's really it. Humanity discovered an algorithm that could really, truly learn any distribution of data, or really the underlying rules that produce any distribution of data. No, Sam, it doesn't work like that. So... Deep learning is a non-linear function approximator, all right? That's all it does. And uh, for the record, it doesn't really learn any distribution of data. It learns only the distribution of, actually it can predict or estimate on distribution of data that it has seen during training, okay? Otherwise, we have something that is called statistical drift for which the deep learning model, linear regression, whatever you want in machine learning, deep learning included, uh, will start, you know, degrading in the estimations that they run if the data changes or there is a statistical drift with respect to the training data that these model, models have been exposed to. All right, that's exactly how it works. There are no rules that produce any distribution of data. These are called statistical distributions, and uh, they don't learn truly anything about that, okay? They just approximate. To a shocking degree of precision, the more compute and data available, the better it gets at helping people solve hard problems. That's another very bad misunderstanding by Sam Altman, who clearly doesn't understand how deep learning works, because this stuff works as long as the domain that deep learning is acting or is you know estimating is a narrow domain for which you have an enough an amount of you know observations that can represent that domain and can explain or cover 
that domain pretty completely. Um, in all other cases, you have an unbounded problem, which means that you don't have enough data to represent that problem, especially in the edge cases. And guess what? Language is one such a problem. It's an unbounded domain. So the domain in which you think the more, da the more data you put and the more money you throw to the problem, uh, this is exactly one of those problems that this doesn't happen, okay? More data, more energy, and more money doesn't necessarily mean solving a problem because the problem is unbounded. With this statement, you are trying to break mathematics and probably physics and thermodynamics and a bunch of other things. Okay, let's go on. I find that no matter how much time I spend thinking about this, I can never really internalize how consequential it is. Now, I think you should internalize how theory works and how technical, um, you know, the technical details about deep learning. That's what you should internalize. And then, you know, the consequences, maybe you can think about that stuff later. There are a lot of details we still have to figure out, yeah, but it's a mistake to get distracted by any particular challenge. Deep learning works, that's his statement, and we will solve the remaining problems, whatever they are. We can say a lot of things about what may happen next, but the main one is that AI is going to get better with scale and that will lead to meaningful improvements to the lives of people around the world. So basically here he's trying to convince us, or well, investors, about something um, that is absolutely not true, which is the more data you throw to the you know, model, um, meaning that you know, the bigger the model or the bigger the training set, the more energy you throw to the, to the model, which means, of course, you know, more money to run uh, large language models, in particular OpenAI's large language models, aka the more money you put into the machine, the faster we get to the truth, right? Or solving all the fucking problems of humanity. That's what he tries to do. And, you know, he thinks that, of course, people are, you know, I won't say stupid, but they don't grasp this exactly, this exact point, which probably it is, like majority of people don't see in this a misleading message. They see probably something that, you know, makes sense to them, and it's a visionary concept, you know. Um, <clears throat> uh, AI models will soon serve as autonomous pers personal assist and blow a bunch of bullshit that we don't want to go through. But essentially, you know, this is like the, um, the, tr the, the, the type of conclusions that people like Sam Altman try to, uh, to, to draw, uh, especially when someone gives them the space, a, mi a virtual microphone or a virtual pen to, you know, uh, spread these words to society. Um, and he concludes with many of the jobs we do today would have looked like traveling wastes of time to people a few hundred years ago. But nobody's looking back at the past. Like what? Like being a farmer or, I don't know, being building bu builders? Wishing they were a lamplighter. If a lamplighter could see the world today, <laughs> believe me, he would run away. He would think the prosperity all around him was unimaginable. And if we could fast forward a hundred years from now, from today, the prosperity all around us would feel just as unimaginable. All right. So, you know, this is the type of uh, words that Sam Altman keeps writing um, in order to convince investors that um, they are doing a great job by wasting their money. But time will tell, and uh, I'll see you next time. Take care.